so glad to have um, Dr. Vito Latelza. I'm sorry if I'm saying it wrong, who graduated from WK in 2001. He is currently the associate professor at the University of Agda, I am so sorry, in Norway. And today he will, he will be speaking to us on the return of the welfare state in Africa, question mark. And we're so excited to have someone who has been um, writing a lot about the corona um, virus recently, uh, especially as the chief editor of Corona Times. And if you saw some of the promo materials, you will see a link to that um, as well. And we really are great to hear the perspective of an anthropologist today and a social scientist. And we hope that this will be a very insightful and in informative conversation. Um, Again, if you have, if you can switch on your video, I know that Swaziland is a bit tricky with Wi-Fi, for example, so I will switch my video off until the end. But if you can keep your video on, please do. Otherwise, um, towards the end when we have the Q&A, if you'd rather switch it off for now and then switch it on then, that would be greatly appreciated as well, just for engagement purposes. Um, I will hand it over to you, Vito. Thank you. Thank you, Nosimilo, for inviting me and for organizing this. Um, well, first of all, I want to say I'm very pleased to be back, albeit sadly only virtually, but hopefully pandemic permitting, we'll, I will be back in Waterford more physically, you know, in the not so distant future, but it's still very nice to be here. And uh, a warm greeting to Mrs. and Mr. O'Connor, who had already a bit greeted before, and to Quinton Reisman as well, who are now, you know, from my Waterford Times. And uh, also nice to see uh, current students. Of course, I don't know you, but thank you for being here and um, uh, engaging, you know, with me uh, this evening. Um, I will keep it quite uh, informal, uh, fundamentally, perhaps about uh, 20 minutes talk or so, and, you know, feel free to interrupt if you have anything burning or that, uh, you know, you want to discuss or have clarified, and then we can have it more as a conversation after an initial uh, talk. Um, the idea of the talk was really uh, comes from the current moment um, it, and it's about trying to understand how crucial or not the changes that we are seeing connected to the pandemic uh, across Africa and of course across the world. When I mean Africa, I mean Africa in the world, not as some kind of isolated ghetto of some kind. Um, what, what is happening and what can we start, if you, if you want, uh, how can we divine the potential futures that we're seeing? What kind of trends are we seeing, good and bad, that we, we should start thinking about as uh, anthropologists, social scientists, as young future leaders, you know, students of Waterford, as teachers and, uh, and, and all that. Um, the title of the talk was, um, the full title was The Return of the Welfare State in Africa, question mark. I, we're not too sure, but perhaps there is something that, that is happening. And current and future scenarios about state intervention in public health and the economy in response to COVID-19. Um, just as a brief intro, uh, and of course, you know much more about it because you've been there uh, during COVID-19. Uh, in terms of my personal experience was that I was actually in South Africa, in Cape Town, when the pandemic, when the pandemic was declared a pandemic. And I was just lucky I had my wits about to just say, mm, I think I need to live here or I might be stuck in South Africa for a bit too long, although I would have loved, but not that long and not so far away from family. I left about two days before all the borders were closed. I was supposed to be there until mid-April and then mid-March. I just left and then everything unfolded since then, sadly in Italy with very tragic uh, outcomes, uh, more likely in the Nordics, although Sweden was also quite bad. I work in Norway, Norway had a pretty good response and you know, we've seen what happened in other parts of the world. But basically then everybody was, especially from the West, somehow thinking, okay, well, no, things will go very bad in Africa. African countries will have this, uh, you know, mega catastrophe and all that. It didn't happen, at least so far, you know, fingers crossed, we didn't have such bad outcomes as expected. Uh, of course, it's still very bad. Of course, we have thousands of people dead across the continent. And we will have probably, as we are discovering now with data, many more with serious permanent damages. That's what's coming out really strongly now. That is not just the fatality of COVID, but that this thing is really nasty. 
So please don't buy into any such theories that, uh, you know, there's herd immunity or that you can just, it's just a cold and all that. If you ever hear anything like that, for all of us, we have to really strongly fight that. Sadly, it's coming even from quite uh, so-called authoritative voices. But the point was, I wanted to start from that to understand what happened. Of course, there might be also some climatic and demographic factors. Uh, African population is younger, so that's definitely a factor. Um, but what we've seen is we have seen a pretty good health response from the authorities actually across many African countries. I'm a bit generalizing here. So, of course, there have been some very bad cases. For instance, Mango Fool in Tanzania going very much the idea that COVID was somehow a conspiracy. But on the whole, especially if you look at countries like Rwanda or Senegal and South Africa, despite all the criticism about the spending, we have seen a pretty uh, good response from the states in terms of how to operate. In many ways, African states were far more prepared than European states. And that was really the uh, excellent work of the Africa CDC, the Center for Disease Controls and Prevention, which was newly formed. So quite recent work done on the back of the West African Ebola epidemic, because that's when people really got worried. Ebola got out of Congo. Now Ebola is even far more lethal and, uh, you know, than, than COVID. So the, the African states had to come together and say, okay, we need to stop this. We need to find very efficient ways to um, uh, find some response. Of course, also with the help and the cooperation of the international community. So by the time uh, COVID starts spreading, basically African states were pre, you know, there was controls in African airports. In Europe, we struggled to find any controls even in the middle of July after the European Union just decided go have a holiday and sadly we're seeing the effects of this kind of, you know, uh, let's just go on with it. Um, so we had a pretty good coordinated response. Um, and what we're seeing also in the middle of the pandemic, especially states that had a bit more buying power, for instance, Nigeria or uh, South Africa, even in terms of emergency grants, so beyond just the health, uh, in terms of emergency grants, we've seen basically some kind of welfare state resurging. Now we have uh, a unprecedented now universal benefit in South Africa uh, that gives 350 rands per month, basically to survive through this uh, really tough period with all the unemployment and this is economic disruption that COVID brought. So I wanted to basically put a positive note here to say, if we are seeing these responses, despite very limited capacity, I mean, very few ventilators across the continent, you know, health system very much on its knees. Um, despite all of that, we've seen actually states reacting quite positively, you know, with, with some exceptions. I don't want to enter now in the issue of Eswatini. I don't know enough. I've heard, you know, contrasting stories on that. But um, in general, if we've seen these responses, the first point I want to make is what actually made them possible at all was the presence of the state. So what do I mean by the role of the state? I mean, in uh, the last basically 20, now 30 to 40 years, there's been a massive, massive propaganda operation, if you want, if you want to use a bit more provocative term, but let's say ideological, an ideological consensus all across the world, from Africa to Europe, to Asia, to America, that somehow these states could only be bad or corrupt or authoritarian, so in many ways, we, don't, we didn't need the states. That was the message that was given to us very much in a very sustained way from the 1980s onwards. And this was not just across Africa, but in Africa that corresponded very much with the structural adjustment programs, which were programs spearheaded by the World Bank and the IMF, primarily back then in Latin America and in Africa, to say the state is bad, it's full of corrupt people, uh, is just inefficient, is not the way to actually deliver for democracy and for good outcomes. So you just got to cut the budgets. And that was on the back of a debt crisis. The African states were heavily indebted. These were the same institution that had given African states their money and then said back, no, but now your debt is unsustainable. So please, you have to now cut your health budgets, you have to cut your education budgets, and you have to open up to the free market, so-called. Of course, at that point, what in 1980s and 1990s free market meant, meant actually big Western corporations. Then later, of course, China, India, and other players came in. But at that moment, it was very specifically, a very specific strategy, geopolitical strategy from Western countries to open up African markets and reduce state intervention. 
because what we had at that point, again, I'm generalizing a bit, and there are many, many varieties of things from more uh, militant socialist state to states that were more social democratic, but fundamentally, African states, uh, since the mid 60s onwards, since the liberation uh, period, had heavily invested in the state, were building up, you know, on the scraps of a colonial legacy that had uh, strongly basically undermine the capacity of African uh, countries to prosper, uh, to build up education, to build up uh, public health, uh, strong intervention in the economy, there were local industry flourishing all over Africa. All of that fundamentally, to cut the story short, was basically wiped out by the structural adjustment programs, which had the direct impact of killing millions of people, not because the you know, policy killed people directly, not because there were guns or, or, or wars, or, at a war, but because basically cutting down those budgets, which were vital for keeping, you know, socioeconomic and development indicators going, created basically a major health crisis. It is also not an accident, and now we can think in retrospect in a much more uh, nuanced way about it. We, we always been told that the HIV crisis was just, again, a biological crisis. And what I've also been telling us with a lot of the focus on behavioral change, which is also very much part of that kind of neoliberal ideology, that if people got HIV, it was just because they were having risk uh, behavior, perhaps the culture uh, didn't uh, kind of change it. The responsibility was put fully on the individuals and some kind of social cultural factors. We now know from COVID that basically the difference why you have low mortality rates, for instance, in Germany, if you had to look at Europe, which was badly, badly hit, by the pandemic with very little preparation, Germany had much less deaths than Italy, France, UK, and all the major states. Why? They were much more prepared. They acted very quickly with mass testing. And most importantly, at the point of the pandemic, while almost all European states, and I'm now moving to Europe for comparison, so we understand this global picture, had basically cut hugely on health budgets, of course, still starting from a much more prosperous and privileged position than African countries, but structuring the same phenomena going through the 90s and the 2000s. Germany was one of the few countries that even with some cuts had fundamentally kept a very large number of hospital beds and intensive care units. COVID was the same. Germany in many social, cultural, demographic factors was similar to other European countries, perhaps more similar to Northern European, the Southern Europeans. There was basically no other factors to justify why in Germany with COVID, you basically, until now at least, you die much less. That, that was the fact, Incre in, in, hugely less. We're talking about a few thousand deaths versus Italy with you know, reaching 40,000 or more if you count also all the excess deaths. So my point there is that we can now see through COVID because of the attention that it brought. And again, this is about privilege because now Europeans and rich countries have to think what happened to us. That when we talk about the HIV crisis, we're also talking fundamentally about a crisis of neoliberalism. The policy that just brought the state's intervention to law, people had to then do with much less. People had to have been very, very exploitative workplaces with very low wages, uh, very little union protections. Uh, very little hospitals and healthcare that could take care of uh, other comorbidities. And that is part of the HIV crisis. And that's also is one of the major things. So what you see from the 80s, 90s, when we had that huge slash on life expectancy that we saw across the continent, especially in Southern Africa, connected with HIV, corresponds almost maps with this massive program of delegitimizing and defunding the state. So that's the reason for the question today is, so what are we going to do about this? So first, there is this, this ideological change that we need to do. We need to recuperate and understand, and I think COVID is showing quite clearly as a, uh, uh, as a clear, brutal experiment, if you want, across the world, that where states are strong, that they can invest in health system, they can invest in the economy, so they can keep, uh, they can give welfare to people when you have no jobs, which also what happened in European states now, the reason why Italy is still not economically collapsed after two, three months of lockdown, the reason why in Norway, the GDP fall compared to most rich countries was minimal, is because the state 
injects massive amounts of money in the economy through grants to protect working class and middle class people, through major uh, uh, grants or, or very special loans given to companies to bail them out so that they don't collapse and they can keep employment and through all these different forms. I would like to go further there because also the kind of stereotype of the so-called authoritarian Chinese state, which of course, not to say that China's got huge issues on democracy and human rights, as many other rich countries do in different ways, just we have to see what happens to migrants when they try to cross the Mediterranean in Europe. Um, but China has also shown us in very few weeks, basically, what a powerful state can do. The Chinese economy is recovering, the rest of the world is not. And we don't even know now in Europe and America if we're going through a second wave of lockdowns, which economically will be, again, even more devastating than the first one. So. What we're seeing, if you look, for instance, at Taiwan, you know, where uh, within weeks, uh, Taiwan started uh, manufacturing its own um, uh, masks and its own supply. We are seeing the resurgence of states as a clear protector of life. Life on the health level, i.e. reducing mortality in the immediate, but it's especially about well-being, the possibility of surviving with a decent salary, with an economy goes on, without letting people starve, without losing the supply chains. So that's the question now. What's going to happen now to African countries out of this crisis? The economic impacts of COVID are devastating and just as devastating. I'm not going to make the argument that the economy comes before life or the other way around. Together, put together the biological impact of COVID with the economic impact of COVID, it's really, really devastating. African states at the moment, on the whole, South Africa perhaps is the only exception. That's why they could even roll out such substantial grants for, again, very modest grants compared to any rich welfare state in the North, um, is because they have stronger resources, they have a much like, a bigger tax base. But the bottom line is that at the moment, there is no money in that system. It's not an issue of how much corruption there is. They can do all the campaigns they want on the Daily Maverick to say that Ramaphosa's friends. Yes, of course, when there is money, there's always some level of corruption. But, you know, so is Trump corrupt and, you know, sold his own, uh, tried to sell his own uh, faulty test because he had the company was investing in. I mean, this stuff happens everywhere. It's really not. There is no African exception there. Corruption is very much a result of neoliberalism. Where you have a lot of corporate money and you have little state kind of controls, you get corruption. That's basically what we're seeing in the last few decades around the world. But the bottom line is that there is no money in the pots. So if a state, for instance, like Zambia, or you know, states that have much less money, uh, wants to do a mass grants, they've given a few grants, whatever, they simply can't because they don't have actually the money in the coffers. There is no tax base for that. Why is there no tax base? Does it mean that Africa is poor? Africa is not poor. If you look, for instance, at the report from 2017 from Global Justice Now, um, uh, they basically showed quite clearly that African countries as a whole in 2015 received $162 billion in uh, loans, aid and remittances. So they also counted the fact that there's an African diaspora sending money back from all over the world. But in that same year, $203 billion, so $40 plus billion left of, of balance, left the continent. So Africa was losing $43 billion through resources that they had. A lot of it was illicit flows, but a lot of it was company profits on minerals and natural resources, including also agribusiness and all of that. So Africa is not poor in the sense of resources or even actual economy. There's real wealth created in Africa that just leaves through taxation loopholes, uh, through Mauritius, through the tax havens. Basically, many African states through those neoliberal policies that I briefly explained took really hold in the 1980s, 1990s, have opened up to corporates from all over the world, tax them almost nothing. Uh, corporates also do their own cheating and all that. So fundamentally, even when billions of dollars are produced in many African countries, very little remains in the economy. Wages are very low, and that's a situation that you can see in any country, even like Eswatini, if you look at the wages in Eswatini are appallingly low. You know, they're even one third, you know, if you go on the working class than the levels of South Africa and all that. So I think any of you who've been, uh, you know, in Eswatini long enough or anywhere in an African country understands that economy on a very uh, experiential level. So the point is now that if we want then to avoid further catastrophe, the next Ebola, the next COVID that might go out of control, we're not out of the woods yet, 
uh, and all that. If you want, in effect, guarantee what we call human security and human prosperity for people, a prosperous population, we need to have strong states that are strongly interventionist in issues like health and the economy. We need to get the money from somewhere. This is about money. It not, it's not just about skills. It's not that having few exceptional doctors is going to sort out all the problems. You need money to train these doctors. You need a health system to, to buy uh, enough masks and protective equipment. You need to have the hospitals and you need to build them with the right specification to, cure, to, to treat COVID and to treat other diseases, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what, what's next? What's the program now? There is, of course, now a big crisis that is looming over the continent and that comes from the same death trap that was started in the 70s and 80s. African states, on the back of kind of economic growth that again, very unequal and very unequally distributed, that came then in the 2000s after what the neoliberal economies call shock therapy, basically started lending, started borrowing again money very heavily on these international financial markets is what we call now euro bonds. Uh, South Africa got one, uh, Nigeria, Zambia, several African countries got that. And various forms of financing, also from China, other forms of smaller finances for specific infrastructure projects. Basically borrowing heavily on money that Africa didn't have. The issue of course is not the borrowing. All the rich states that we see now in the world were built on borrowing. At some point, America still has one of the biggest public debt in the world. Uh, Europe was built on borrowing, you know, with the Marshall Plan after World War II. The issue is not borrowing, but it's the mechanism, it's the debt trap that these kind of borrowings can bring you into. So in this very uh, free market system, what happens is that the creditors come at the right moment, which is for them right in inverted commas, when you are actually on your knees and you have all your economic indicators down, i.e. you cannot sustain anymore to pay all those interests. It's very much like loan charts or going to a bank and being strangled when you have a, a, your own economic crisis. You keep on servicing interest, then perhaps you lose your job because of a crisis or something or you lose income. All of a sudden, your house might be repossessed because you're not able to pay the mortgage. It's a very similar mechanism. The creditors now, and that's why it's not an accident that we call them vulture funds, they're basically literally vulturing over countries that are struggling to repay even the interest on the debt because the economies under COVID got such a hit and they will not be recovering in any substantial way anytime soon because they're so connected also to these global flows. They also have, again, the weakness of very little self-sufficiency. They're very reliant on this global import export that makes them very globalized in this unequal and uneven way. At that point, the creditors come knocking and say, hey, now Zambia, you gotta give me your copper. Now Congo, I want your cobalt so that I can do more electric cars in Norway and in America and so on and so forth. So at the moment, we're on the verge of a potential huge debt crisis. And even the mechanism to sort out the COVID shortage is that there is a long list of African countries, including South Africa, Angola and others, who now getting, and uh, Eswatini has just signed one, who are now getting loans from the IMF on similar, very unfavorable conditions, you know, basically because just they need the money to survive, again, to keep some level of health delivery, some grants to keep the economy going and all of that. So this model is not gonna work. At some point, something is gonna give. So either we're gonna see these creditors, which are not just corporates, but they're also states, because when we talk about the IMF and the World Bank, we're talking about states that have geopolitical interests in those minerals, in those natural resources, because of course, Europe, America, China want those resources to keep their growth going. They need copper to build electric wires. Anything that is built around comes from those minerals, comes from those natural resources. So we need the radical overall of the system and the opportunity hidden in this crisis, it's exactly that that if African states now come together and they've done some important steps, for instance, with the African continental free trade area, they need to basically leverage to say, listen, international community, listen, creditors, listen, states that deal with us have multilateral trade relations with us. We cannot pay the debt. And because we were already in a very unfavorable situation, it's not our fault. We are not very much like the normal middle class or working class 
you know, family that loses the mortgage because they lost the job and they got very unfavorable deals from the bank, which they didn't even necessarily understand in the small print. It's not the worker's fault that their factory closed. It's not the worker's fault that the banks can repossess the house in such an easy way during a crisis. So it's very similar to that. That money was already given and sent already on the assumption, the creditors already knew that they could bank on that. That was that leverage for even giving all the money in the first place. So the opportunity in this very big crisis that will definitely continue to unfold, so we're only at the beginning of seeing the real impacts of COVID in that way, is that now African states have a choice or better, they're pushed very much into a corner. If they keep on supporting the corporates, also through the corrupt ties, of course, of politicians who are in the pockets of these corporates, because that's how the system globally works, you reduce state capacity and you buy off the politicians fundamentally. Sometimes it's not necessarily legal. Uh, you do it through revolving doors. You, a politician gets a board uh, membership as soon as they finish the, doing MP. That's what's happening all over the world, Europe, America, Africa, and everywhere. At this point, the same politicians will have people on the street protesting, say, hey, we got nothing now. What, what are we going to do? If we're going to have this debt crisis coming, the economy is collapsing, we still need to keep COVID restriction and, you know, for a year or two at least, forget about having a global distribution of vaccine yet. So there's still going to be a lot of uh, international hits that affect basically African productivity. Something is going to give. At that point, that's where the opportunity is. Single states cannot do it on their own. They will just be crushed and basically Again, they will be used, people will just move capital elsewhere. You need basically strong regional and continental uh, alliances that negotiate very tough on these negotiating tables to say, this is what we want. You want parts of our minerals? You need to give us this. We need more taxes from you so that we can build our hospitals better. We need to have local manufacturing so that we we'll build our own industries. So this is very shortly, we can talk a bit more about the strategies. But if something like that doesn't happen, then we're going to see something, it's quite possible that we'll be seeing something of the same brutal shock therapy, if not worse, three, four decades after. So with even more free markets in the way that basically just create a lot of inequalities and a lot of money concentrated in very few people, and more and more people who basically struggle to put food on the table with all these incidents of various diseases you know, further, as we already know from Southern Africa, from the uh, plague of HIV, you know, how that can become uh, uh, further crippling people, uh, the economy and society. I think I'll stop here. Uh, so open it up to the floor for questions, but also conversations. So um, yeah, I think I'll, um, for now, I'll, that this will be my, my small talk to introduce the topic. Yeah. Awesome, thank you so much, Vito. Um, I'd like to open it up to the floor now for anyone who has questions um, for Vito. I mean, I, I guess before, as people think of questions, I can start with one. Um, one of the things that you, you started with at the beginning was the idea of um, negatively impacting theories. And I think on the continent, we can see these things, not just as it links to COVID, but also like the economic rationale behind COVID being a thing. So from an anthropologist perspective, how do you think we can tackle the negatively impacting theories on COVID? And how do you think, and what do you think this will look like post COVID as well? Uh, just to clarify, what kind of negative impacts are you, because of course the impacts is very broad. Do you have something specific so think, in mind? Um, really more the theories than the impacts themselves. So it's like, you know, I feel like on the continent there's a lot of like, um, propaganda and the rest, like the reasoning behind COVID being there, some of it like as an influence of the West in an attempt to restructure the African economy as one of those reasons. So it's like all these like propaganda, the rhetoric that isn't really true that has people believing that COVID is non-existent or that the repercussions of COVID won't be as extreme as we know they will be. I mean, there, there is a, this is again, and that's why it's very important when we talk about uh, African cases to always talk globally. This is now a global wave of propaganda. And I mean, the US election will probably be lost or won on that. So uh, just to give an example. Um, 
uh, and this is far more than just far right. I mean, Sweden is a center left government and went for so-called herd immunity. So it's a far bigger. Of course, there is a lot of right wing interest in that, but it's getting also far bigger. The interest, sadly, again, it comes down to economics businesses and i don't want to generalize all businesses but definitely large parts of big business or people who make a lot of money to put it very at a lot i mean they basically were really scared in the first weeks of covid they were not really scared just because covid scared them i mean these are uh, tough companies that plan for all kinds of you know they're involved in wars and all that that's not the catastrophe per se that scared the big companies what really scared them is that all over the world, from different starting points, states started to quickly gain in ground and control the situation. Again, for the first time in 40 years, you had states strongly intervening in everything. States regulating where people would go. States saying, sorry, we need to keep the supermarkets open, but these shops close because the supermarkets have to feed people, but we cannot go to the discos. Business was scared because that business that has grown in the last 30, 40 years it's gone on the idea that business does everything. Business can deliver health and can deliver this, it can deliver entertainment. It should not be regulated by the state. So a lot of the propaganda comes from that undercurrent. It's not as easy as just calling it ignorance and all that. There's basically now troll factories all around the world, very much like we've seen it. It happens in a lot of states, uh, you know, uh, on many elections. Manufacturing propaganda that has to convince people that COVID is just a flu or the best way is herd immunity and there's no scientific evidence for that whatsoever. Basically false information for a very specific goal to keeping states at bay and keeping what they call the economy going. But we need to be clear that businesses don't want to keep the economy going. They want to keep their economy going. It's not that there is no economy when a state decides that we keep supermarkets open, but we close these other shops so that people don't die. It's still economy. It's a different kind of economy. So that's what we need to, to, to struggle for. Um, it's the question of how we undo that. I mean, I think institutions like Waterford Kamplaba are central in that because education is key, not just to educate ourselves on those theories. We need to go out there as influencers, we need in a way to use the same weapons, of course, without the dirty, nasty ethics of that, to be the warriors of the other story. So we need to be there in our Facebook circles, in our classes, whatever we can do digitally and physically to convince our relatives that, hey, this is actually the data. This is actually what reputable scientists are saying. This is actually the data on how lockdowns work or don't, so now we can do it. So please don't listen to this stuff. But the most important thing there again, if we just stop at the idea that there are ignorant people out there, that they are gullible, we're not gonna get very far. First, it doesn't really work saying that we are elites and the others are gullible, ignorant. I don't think it's a very good selling point regardless of whether that's true or not, it's very elitist. But the second thing is that we need to convince people. So to convince people, we need a bigger theory. We cannot just tell them you're reading false information. That battle is already lost. Why? Because it's a matter of firing power. We are at the level where licensed doctors and top, so-called top scholars from top institutions, prestigious institutions like LSE, Stanford and all that, are saying that herd immunity works. We know data whatsoever that this can be done. First, that it works because immunity so far we know lasts perhaps a few months at most. So you would have to do this herd immunity strategy every twice a year. Second, no, basically, if it even works for a few months, it will mean millions of people dying in the process of spreading this virus with no control. Just to give you an example. Yet, you say, how is it possible the top people in Oxford, LSE, Stanford are supporting this? So, to just put the battle on the idea of truth versus falsehood, sadly, it's not going to work. We know that it is a falsehood, but it won't work because we are in what people call the post-truth world. People like Trump and who he represents have been able to move us in a space where truth is what convinces you. So we need to think about what is it that is convincing people? This is a psychological warfare in a sense. They're using emotional button. They're pressing on vulnerabilities and fears to convince people of a certain theory. So probably I'm getting a bit absent here. So I don't know, Nosimilo, and perhaps you can help me clarify. But the bottom line is that our counter messages have to really have a big story behind. To just say, 
we're scientific, where the truth is not going to work anymore. We have lost that legitimacy. We now have to convince people with an alternative political vision to say, hey, these are the people who are paying for these ads and for this information you're reading. The reason why they say that is because they make money out of you risking your life there. And actually, we have all these historical and contemporary cases where we can build a different societies. And actually, you can be safe from COVID, have an economy and have a job. That's the work we need to do. Awesome. Um, does anyone else have any other questions? Oh, we have questions from Quinton. You can go ahead, Quinton. Yeah, my question is, I mean, we, we, you've been looking at Africa and how Africa has been more or less raked by the neoliberal institutions by uh, and so forth. But even within countries like the UK, I think that's probably the most, I'm guessing here a little bit, the most neoliberal of the European states. How, how would you envisage steps to be taken to avoid, let's say, the dis current dismantling of the National Health Service? How, how does the man in the street cope with that kind of, of problem when clearly big business is what's in charge? That, I mean, in, in a way, this is what I'm uh, proposing. I mean, and the reason why, uh, but very good question, uh, Quinton and comment. I mean, fundamentally, you made a very important point that I was also trying to come across, but you reinforced it. We should not look at this system as only regional. This is a global system. Of course, there's big inequalities, but what we see structurally in the UK is not so different from Zambia having closed hospitals because of no state budget. It's just that UK starts from a different level, but it's very, very similar. What we're seeing there, it's the same structural trend. Uh, and in many ways, what's happening, just to conclude a bit, the historical trajectory that I didn't finish before, after these neoliberal policies were heavily experimented with in Africa and Latin America, they landed in Europe. They landed at the center, the very center that were giving them medicine outside now those very powerful countries are in a sense getting their own medicine a taste of their own medicine in a way that is the process and why we're seeing covid ravaging the uk and not other countries and so on the problem i think in a lot of contemporary the critique is very present of course i'm not the first to say and there's a large progressive and left and social movements based that are making similar points and even beyond just more uh, classic left i mean there is a, 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 not a, I wouldn't call it a consensus, but it's a very growing sense of awareness that this doesn't work. Uh, and that's why we get protest movements around the world. That's why we get also new phenomena like Corbyn with very little corporate money, you know, rises to the top of a, of a Labour Party, even though he lost the election. You know, those are quite new phenomena. The problem there is that I think what we are missing in this kind of more protest, you know, awareness campaign kind of mode is we are missing, missing strategies. And that's where I think the kind of social mediafication of life and the kind of protest mode that's taking over. Many of these movements have very little strategic vision on that. And that's where I think where we fail and where we need to be stronger. And I think we can convince many more people by dropping some of the ideological lab labels and really focusing more on what are the policy options on the table. For doing that, that's much more of a work of influence. So while it is key that the person who's directly affected by the health system collapse in UK or Zambia as well should voice their opinion, should have some kind of voice through, you know, unions, associations, stuff to say that we need the popular pressure. So I'm not discarding it in any way. The popular pressure by itself, even when it's widespread and even when you have a movement like Corbyn and all that, is just not enough. We now need to create a cadre of policy influencers, policy makers, who can shift this debate. And to do that, we need to convince people in the center. And to do that, we really need to operate in institutions like Waterford, because it is in those institutions that those cadres are formed. And we have an opportunity now, especially for the younger generation, and I don't mean just, of course, also 18 year olds and below and 15, but also younger generations of professionals, people 40 and below, also my generation in that way, we have an opportunity, they are seeing the cracks. Many people sitting in the Africa Development Bank, many people sitting in the top institutions are seeing that this system doesn't work. And they don't, they, they've come up from a very neoliberal system. So the training tends to be very neoliberal. I mean, we could check also in this room also how 
people have been exposed to these ideas. You know, all the generation from the children of the 80s and 90s onwards, basically, neoliberalism is the default mechanism that you get even in your education system. But are, we are seeing the cracks. The younger people are seeing the cracks. The people of my generation are seeing the cracks. But we now need to do the policy work to be able to be there on the negotiating table to say, this is the next step that African leaders can do, that European leaders can do. So you need a consensus from the bottom, of course. But what we're missing is really is the policy implementation, the fact to be strategic. The neoliberal system at the moment, the corporates, the business people, and the technocrats on the side are far more strategic still. And that's why I think it's, it's not the only reason, it's also power, but it's one strong reason why they still have the upper hand. Awesome. Any further questions? Um, uh, when, when you, I think it was a statement that we need um, a more uh, stronger um, government uh, to sustain with such issues as the COVID, but I do assume uh, that uh, this uh, more stronger could uh, become a race of authoritarian and totalitarian regimes over the world. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good question, but it's also a very ideological question. The, there is always a danger of authoritarianism and totalitarianism, whether you are Shell or whether you are the Zambian state. It's not the Shell is less likely to become a totalitarian, uh, you know, law unto itself, undemocratic and all that. So that's perhaps the first shift we need to do is that it's not something inherently bad with the state. Any large scale structure can become as the danger of becoming authoritarian, totalitarian, undemocratic. That's an organizational structure issue if we look in broader economic and anthropological terms beyond the current moment. The question is that that's why we need popular movements. Popular movements and the kind of grassroots movements is what keeps states democratic and what keeps democratic accountability going. So this is not, again, about the danger of creating another elite of technocrats, even perhaps enlightened technocrats on a more progressive agenda, who then decide everything and know the way for everybody else. The technocrats, the policymakers, have to constantly interact with people. What we need, however, for that to work, and that's what really what the good historical example of good social democracy and other socialist states, both in Africa, the West and elsewhere, teach us, you know, especially at the height in 1950s and then later in Africa, 60s and 70s, is that you need intermediate associations to do that. Popular protests that are just hashtags or just on social media or end up on the streets by themselves can become very undemocratic. They can be manipulated. They can actually be used even against the, 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 the belief of the participants for those regime change, for those very undemocratic moves. That's what we're seeing with a lot of propaganda online. So the key is to rescue intermediate association. The reason why those welfare states and those social democracies work quite well that with all other issues, we are even talk about climate today and all other things. I'm not saying we are repeating the past. There's a lot of problems there that we need to sort out. But one strong reason was the intermediate association. If you were a worker, you had unions. Unions were not just some large scale monolith. You had the union rep at your workflow level. You had the union rep at your institution level. You had churches that had representation in civil society that represented you. You had other professional associations. We had intermediate spaces, that's the technical term that academics use, intermediation, that basically allowed a structured discussion between people with less power, so it was always an imbalance of power, and people with more power. That, those are the kind of mechanisms we need to create democratic states that are also effective. But we need to remember that a strong state is not by default undemocratic. Norway is a very strong state. Even with a neoliberal right-wing government, the Norwegian economy is highly state regulated. It's, nobody would, 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 would define it authoritarian. So we need to rescue that kind of tradition. Do you think that in the state that in the present moment, all those um, unions have been undermined and they have lost too much power to, to be effective. Yes, I think that that's the, one of the problems why we are failing to do what I'm suggesting and other people are suggesting. To be able to bring that strategic policy grounds 
you need to have basically strong bureaucracies. I use the word not in a negative terms like unions, strong democratic bureaucracies, because those what the strong organizations did, they basically were like mini states, you know, they had their own advisor, they had the research wings, and then they had the politicians. So once uh, the, the kind of, and, and the, the, this kind of so-called democracy wave from the 80s, 90s, which was effectively produced the opposite effects, kind of went around saying, no, 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 you don't need the unions, no, no, no you don't need these associations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We have basically killed that capacity to be strategic. And for now, for the unions to get back to the place where they were, it's, it's, I, to me, there's no doubt that they need state intervention. The way Thatcher got to the unions was through legal laws anyway. It was the laws. Of course, then there was a real action. But basically, all those union rights were enshrined in the law. So again, without a strong state support now, I don't see unions by themselves from the grassroots being able to regain that power. In that case, um, before you say your last words, Vigil, I think some of the things that stood out for me as you were talking is the idea of African states lacking self-sufficiency. And in my mind, it becomes worrying because I'm um, moving forward and just to like really shift the conversation back to the COVID um, in, in um, situation. If we're talking about countries that lack self-sufficiency, countries that are going through um, who are going through economic crisis before COVID and will see more of this and are already defaulting on their debt, that it creates a problem moving forward. So um, before you, your, your ending notes, um, what's, the next, what's the next move? Where to from here, um, African states that lack self-sufficiency, that are probably going to go through even more economic crisis, that are going to probably default even more on their international debt or debt with the IMF, and that need to operate in the larger system, but have really been looked at as countries defaulting on debt and um, have not been integrated into the global system. What's the next step? Where do we go from here? Yeah, that's a very good question. I mean, the point here is that um, we're not going to have single state solutions because that global system that you mentioned is too strong. The point is also not to blame globalization, as so many far right have already done and used that. The point is that we don't like this kind of globalization. It's not that we're against movement or we're against trade. So states have to come in alliances with each other. Some can be more regional at the beginning, it's already happening, but it can lead to more organic continental alliances, ideally, as is also already happening, to basically bargain with the resources they have. Those states have to change the terms of trade, to use the term, by saying, hey, I've got copper and cobalt, and it's only Zambia and, 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 and Congo that have something like 70, 80% of resources in the world. Do you want this copper? These are the terms of trade. Oh, you don't want to follow the terms of trade? Perfect. I'm not going to go to this state because I want to work with state X, who's actually following my terms of trade. So this is not an anti-globalization uh, movement. This is basically creating alternative trade ties and creating your globalizations and your international ties with the people who respect, who respect you and who actually are interested in having a mutually beneficial relation. There's still power. I'm not talking about here some kind of uh, you know, fairy tale. But the point is that it can be a much better redistribution of power. And make no mistake, the reason why China is dominant in Africa now is not because they went around colonizing Africa, it's because they offered better terms of trade. You know, they are the ones building the hospitals and building the roads. Very few Western companies or Western development even do anything that they used to do back then. Again, there's a lot of power and there's a lot of hegemonic things, but it made sense for a lot of African states to accept better terms of trade. That, that the trade can also be made better, but the, what we need now is that states have to have the courage to say, I'm going to default. Alone, they will not survive. Their economy will just be gutted. They need to create an alliance where African states, regional alliances, go to the stable and say, hey, we're not going to pay. We can't pay. And you still want our resources? These are the terms. We need to renegotiate the whole deal, which also includes stop the militarization of the Sahel, stop killing African people in the Mediterranean, create mobility. Without that, we don't trade with you. It's as simple as that. It's not 
uh, any other threat than that. It's not terrorism, it's not uh, uh, war, it's basically saying, I don't want to deal with you. Of course, this is easier said than done. You also spelled out a very important thing, power. It's not that tomorrow states wake up with paramilitaries paid by uh, powerful corporations, you know, these militias, all of that is being fueled by the same interest. So, I mean, these are not, they know how to play the game. Uh, that's how Congo collapsed. That's how uh, Mozambique might become a new, uh, you know, who knows what uh, uh, so-called terrorism area. There is already infiltration all over the continent. This has to be done in a strategic way. Not, cannot be done in an oppositional protest way. That will not work. Strategically, states, citizens, associations, unions, anybody interested in these broader things, they need to start shifting those terms of trade. They need to start shifting power and reinvest. To come to just finish on self-sufficiency, and then I'll take Quinton's question or comment. The self-sufficiency is key, which of course I, I bit generalized. There is already a lot of self-sufficiency in terms of what people are doing on the ground. People are doing amazing things with no state support, and that should be propped up by the state you know, what's, what's happening even on rural areas and all that. But it's under threat if it's not gonna be protected. Where they have a state now that is basically working against them for the corporates. Self-sufficiency means, again, not some idea of outer key. I don't mean that uh, African states have to cut all ties. It means that while you have all these corporates on your playground and doing all kinds of games and all that, and all these geopolitical interests, you need to start building your manufacturing base. You need to start having some local income that doesn't depend on Glencore, that doesn't depend on China, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a gradual strategy again. But if they don't start doing that, and that we know from cases around the world, that is not just about money. You can do that with few resources. It's political will. You create an alternative economic system that runs alongside the current one until the alternative one becomes stronger and stronger. And then you can really then fight the powers that be in a much more confident and, and, and uh, effective way. Okay. Um, so, so my question is, are, are you sort of proposing something a little bit similar to um, what OPEC was doing in the, in the early 70s when um, they, they started taking control of the oil price um, for a while, they couldn't keep it up. But um, it seems to me that you're, you're sort of proposing organization on a similar kind of level, if I understand you well. Uh, yes, actually, you made it much more concrete. So le let's put it uh, down to it. I think there's a very good example. Um, so now you have the biggest, uh, also to give some more uh, empirical examples so that you can think more empirically, especially for people who are going to go into the future prof professions and the, the youngsters among us who are still deciding what they're, they're going to do later. So renewable energy and renewable uh, transitions is not the biggest thing. I'm not going to explain, I, I hope in Waterford, I'm sure it's going to be a big topic. Otherwise, I would be surprised if you're not talking about it in, in you know, some of your classes and all that, right? So the point is renewable, digitalization, these are two of the, some of the fastest growing sectors in the world. COVID, non-COVID, left, right, whatever model. That's what's happening at the moment around the world. These things are based on basic minerals of which Africa possesses huge amounts of scarce minerals. So it's not that they can go very much like OPEC. The oil is not infinite. They had to go, they, had, they needed that supply. So when you start controlling your industry in the way and start making those alliances, you automatically change the terms of trade. You are setting the price or you are very least influencing the prices because you, you know that those resources are key to keep Norwegian well, to keep my posh middle-class uh, uh, home in Sweden. I cannot survive, I cannot have my privileged salary without those minerals. And the reason why I have that privilege here is because the countries that support my job, the, 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 the corporates that work for that, keep prices low in Africa, e.g. exploiting people, low wages, awful environmental protection. So everything that we don't want to do in Europe, in inverted commas, it's happening in Europe too now, as Quinton said, but still. So at the same moment, I'm, my livelihood is under threat. My privilege is under threat. So that's a huge power that these states have because once they do that, we, we cannot, cannot come to the negotiating table. No way would be dead tomorrow without the cobalt and copper on all the strategies and the, and the livelihoods they're building and even the future strategy on digitalization 
and sustainability. So the key is again to use those things strategically, not to just say no, to just to say, hey, we got this power. So we need to use the power so that we get a better deal. That's how the oil prices change and the oil deals when there were the Italians going around offering better deals against the Americans and all that. That's how it happened in the 60s and 70s. Those redistribution happened because there were better deals cut. It, that's power, basically. It's, it's on a very basic level and it can be used relatively easily. It's really now about finding the ways in which this politic, political will at the policy level, it's, it's put into motion. A major economic catastrophe or the kind of COVID could probably force a lot of politicians to, they'll see that I have very little choices. I mean, I just want to quickly add like what you're talking about, like I can really like resonate with that because in as much as I grew up in the city in Zimbabwe, my father was from the rural parts of the, of the country where we still go, which with they live full time right now. I see all the uh, activities as far as economies are concerned that happen on the ground there. And if you really monetize them and have some kind of a structure around them and what you're talking about strategy, you know, at my firm, we talked about COVID strategy in the next five years. Um, I, I, and then you also have organizations like USAID who also come into these communities to help. And I'm just saying they don't need that, that model of self-sufficiency. I can already see it at a grassroots level. These people can go a month without going to a store. So I think it's a question of propping that up, be it their cotton, their tobacco, their oil, their diamonds and everything, and then use that as a power and as a negotiating chip and trade and everything. So yeah, thank you for sharing those thoughts. Like I, I, I really like that thought process and yeah, that's, that was brilliant. Thank you, Romy. You made very critical example. What I can remi remind, remind people historically, it already happened. The, 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 the post-colonial, early post-colonial states like Zimbabwe, Zambia and all that were uh, implementing all those strategies. It's not an accident that they're still uh, very thriving despite everything, local rural economies. You know, there were extension services, there were agricultural subsidies. Then they were gutted from the uh, structural adjustments and then people yeah. had to fend for themselves. So it became a much more survival strategies. But yeah. fundamentally, what you're saying is not in contrast with having a strong state. The state and these community situations can actually reinforce each other. That's how cooperatives worked in rural Zambia in the 60s and 70s. They were very democratic, very grassroots, with the state support. Yeah. There isn't one strong example around the world of such thriving organization with strong welfare that didn't have a strong state support behind. Yeah. And it, it can also be used in a case of Zimbabwe where we have notorious states, you know, where people depend for them for resources. And I can see if these communities are able to build themselves up and be in, in, in a position where they're financially sufficient and then they can actually maybe, I'm, I'm not sure, stand up to governments like Zimbabwe being controlled by Zano PF and you know, committing all these human rights violations. So I, I think I can also see it from, from even internally helping solve the problems happening within the country, that model. What, what you're highlighting very rightly is the internal dynamic. It should not just be a centralized state coming in and say, this is my diamonds. The local communities have to say, these are also our diamonds. So right. we're negotiating with you and we're negotiating with who you are going to negotiate with so that we get proper environmental standards, we get proper wages, we get a sustainable way to do it. If we think it's not sustainable, we should not use them. That's the, the rights of the local communities also to say no. It's the right to say no. Right. And, to, and that is the right to negotiate economic and social development that works. But we need to build the politics for, for that to happen. And we need to build the policy and the strategic vision for that to happen. And we need to convince people that it works. Thank you so much to everyone who made the time to attend this evening. It's 7.05, so we will call it a day or a night, depending on which part of the world you're in. Um, thank you so much, Vito, for sharing this with us. I will share Vito's email address in, in a follow-up email, and this recording will be available on our YouTube playlist as well as on Gamshaba Connect. Again, 
Thank you so much, Vito. This was a very informative and very insightful conversation. And we hope that the um, recording will incite others to think about the way forward as well. Otherwise, from me and the advancement team, have a good night. Thank you so much, Nasimilo, and everybody. Thank you for engaging. All the best, and we'll keep in touch. Bye, everybody.